Bandana masked, cowboy hat wearing outlaws robbing trains and banks. We've all been exposed to the Hollywood versions of these characters and their infamous exploits. But how did it actually go down? The Wild West was certainly wild. You had people like Butch Cassidy and Jesse James running amok throughout territories that were still largely lawless. But how lawless were they really? Were banks really that easy to rob? How much has legend bled into fact when it comes to the stories we're told about the Wild West? There were certainly some bold robberies in the early days of westward expansion. Robberies that would probably make a modern thief squirm uncomfortably at the sheer ballsiness of the attempts. Here are some of the greatest hits and the stories of the men and women behind them. The Exploits of Butch Cassidy Butch Cassidy was probably one of the most famous and prolific outlaws in the history of the Wild West. I mean, this guy robbed a lot. It's estimated that he committed more than 20 robberies in multiple countries, and he and his gang made off with maybe half a million dollars in loot. That's late 1800s dollars. In today's money, Cassidy and company raked in over 10 million dollars. Robert Leroy Parker, aka Butch Cassidy, was born in Utah in 1866. Cassidy's robbing spree began in the 1890s when he formed a Wild Bunch gang with Harry Longaball, also known as the Sundance Kid. One of their most famous heists came in 1899 when they robbed a Union Pacific train in Wilcox, Wyoming. Cassidy had already made a whole bunch of money from bank and train robberies at this point. His first robbery came a decade earlier when he and his previous gang robbed the San Miguel Valley Bank in Telluride, Colorado to the tune of over $20,000. With over a half million in today's dollars, Cassidy bought a ranch out in Wyoming, from which he'd go on to one of the most prolific high streaks in history. By 1899, Cassidy was flush, but in Wilcox, he would hit real pay dirt. Cassidy and his gang, which at the time included the aforementioned Sundance Kid and another kid, Kid Curry, they really liked their kid nicknames. Anyway, the gang had been planning the robbery for weeks. They'd scouted out the area, planned their escape routes, had on their best designer Wild West mask, and were loaded up with all their best dynamite. On the day of the robbery, the gang waited near a trestle bridge for the Union Pacific train to arrive. When the train approached, the outlaws forced the engineer to stop by waving a big red flag. The engineer shouldn't have stopped. They then separated the engine from the rest of the train, ordered the engineer to move the locomotive down the track a short distance, and then they proceeded to blow up the bridge with the dynamite they had on them. Then they moved to the mail car, which they knew was carrying a whole lot of cash and gold, and used the rest of their dynamite to blow up a safe that held upwards of $35,000 worth of loot. That's a little over a million dollars in today's money. It was, and still is, one of the largest train robberies in American history. The gang divided up the loot and escaped back to their hideout in Hole in the Wall, Wyoming, a good name for a town that housed outlaws, if you ask me. But the Wilcox train robbery didn't go unnoticed. The Union Pacific Railroad and the Pinkerton Detective Agency launched a massive manhunt for Cassidy and his gang once they figured out it was him. Film-worthy hijinks would ensue. No, wait a minute. They did make a movie about it. The Pinkerton Detective Agency was hired by the Union Pacific Railroad to help combat train robberies, which were obviously a common problem at the time. One of the agency's most famous cases was their pursuit of Butch Cassidy and his Wild Bunch gang. The Pinkerton Detective Agency hired a bunch of shady detectives to track down the Wild Bunch. One of the most notable Pinkerton agents involved in the pursuit was Tom Horn, a former cowboy, soldier, and mercenary who was reportedly responsible for the extrajudicial Wild West-style killings of 17 people. Anyway, the Pinkertons pursued the Wild Bunch for a few years, but the gang always squirmed their way out of some tough spots. In 1901, the Pinkertons finally got a photo of Mr. Cassidy and Mr. Sundance, and they started papering streets with those famous wanted signs. That didn't work. Well, it kind of worked. Their gang had basically fallen apart by this point. Cassidy and Sundance, I'm just going to call him Sundance now. I see why he changed his name from Longaball. Well, they fled to New York City with fellow crew member Etta Pace, where they assumed fake identities and hopped a ship headed for Buenos Aires. Cassidy Goes South they kept those robberies going down south. The remaining gang members made their way through Argentina and settled on a ranch in a remote area of Pantagonia, called Cholila, and began robbing banks to finance their lifestyle. In 1905, they robbed the Banco de Tarrapacá, Argentino, in Rio Gallegos and then fled to Chile. 
In 1908, the trio moved to Bolivia and kept the criminal life they knew best, robbing a few more banks, including the Banco de la Nación in the town of San Vicente in 1908. By this point, it's thought that Etta Place had had enough of life on the run, and she reportedly hopped a ship to San Francisco. Or maybe she didn't. There are other reports that she might have ended up in Paraguay. Others say she might have lost her life in a violent run-in in Argentina. And yet others claim that she died of good old old age in 1966. Who knows at this point? Just like at a place, the fate of Cassidy and Sundance is kind of foggy. In 1908, a courier was transporting the payroll for the Aramayo Franca and Sia silver mine in Bolivia when he was held up and robbed by two masked men thought to be two American outlaws. The robbers made off with a whole lot of loot, and the Bolivian authorities obviously weren't pleased and launched a manhunt. Cassidy and Sundance apparently made the mistake of moving around with one mule from the silver mine, which was branded, and someone noticed. Bolivian authorities figured out the two bandits were hiding out at a lodging house in San Vicente, Bolivia, and when they closed in, gunfire broke out. In the aftermath of the battle between Bolivian authorities and Cassidy and Sundance, two bodies were found inside the house. Now, they were assumed to be Cassidy and Sundance. Case closed, the two notorious bandits had met their end. Or did they? The bodies were never positively identified. Researchers in 1991 even tried to go where they were thought to be buried and conduct DNA analysis of remains, but nothing came of it. The story takes an even stranger twist with a newly discovered Chilean newspaper clipping which details how Sundance, using an assumed name, had got in a heated dispute a few years earlier before the battle in Bolivia and was arrested by Chilean authorities in the town of Antofagasta. The arrest was for ending a man's life. He was bailed out, though, bailed out by a U.S. diplomat named Frank Aller, who coughed up $50,000 for the outlaw's bond and even provided him with a house for his house arrest. Sundance would escape yet again, but it's unclear whether or not diplomat Aller knew who he was helping. The Radioactive Snake Oil Salesman Now, the Wild West wasn't just bandits robbing trains and banks with six shooters and masks. There were also plenty of people who robbed people of their money by having them just handed over to them. Scammers who promised this or that cure or remedy. Tricksters who stole money right from under people's noses while they just looked on and loved it. One of the most notorious and most dangerous was a guy named William J.A. Bailey, the radioactive snake oil salesman. Bailey went to Harvard University for a bit, but then dropped out without earning a degree. Still, he fashioned himself a doctor and went around the Wild West claiming he had his medical degree. He started off selling a substance called Lassigo for superb manhood. Superb indeed. The main ingredient was a chemical called strychnine, a potent neurotoxin that's often used in rat poison and can basically shut down the central nervous system if the dose is too high. Then he moved on to his miracle cure. It went by a few names. Bailey affectionately called it Pure Sunshine in a Bottle and the Cure for the Living Dead. But on the bottle, it was labeled Radithor because, well, its main ingredient was radium. Bailey traveled the country giving lectures and selling his radium water to eager customers. He claimed that the water was infused with the healing properties of radium and could cure almost any ailment. He also sold things he called radiant health belts that he said improved circulation and alleviated pain. But Bailey's radium water was a complete fraud. Radium is very radioactive stuff that you shouldn't be messing around with, let alone pushing it as a health remedy. The water that Bailey sold was actually just ordinary tap water that's been exposed to a small amount of radium. It had no healing properties whatsoever. Despite this, Bailey's scam was highly successful. He was able to convince a lot of people to buy his miracle cure, and he made a small fortune from his sales. His fraud was eventually exposed, though, and he was arrested and charged with nuclear war crimes. No, he wasn't charged with nuclear war crimes, but he was charged with fraud. He was found guilty, and he got five years in prison. Bailey's scam wasn't an isolated incident during the Wild West era. A lot of fraudsters and quacks traveled around the country selling all kinds of bogus medicines and potions to gullible customers. The Wild West was lawless, and out there, medicine was too. The Ballad of Jesse James Jesse James wasn't quite as prolific an outlaw as Butch Cassidy, but what he represented in terms of the historical context he came up in was equally as compelling. James and his eventual gang, the James Younger Gang, started their spree in the years right after the Civil War, a time of pretty intense political and social upheaval in the U.S. Now, during the war, both Jesse and his brother Frank fought as guerrillas for the Confederate Army and carried out raids and ambushes against Union forces. After the war, a lot of Confederate soldiers were in a pretty tough spot. Many of them didn't have homes, jobs, or any real future prospects. A lot of them, including the James brothers, 
figured they'd start robbing banks, stagecoaches, and trains to make a bit of money. A lot of people in the South view the James Younger gang's crimes as acts of rebellion against the victorious Union, and the gang became folk heroes in many parts of the former Confederacy. But as we'll see, James and his gang were not exactly Robin Hood-type thieves who stole from the rich and gave to the poor. James first entered the Wild West limelight after robbing a bank in Gallatin, Missouri. He and his gang, which wasn't the James Younger gang yet, had already robbed some banks around Missouri and even off the mayor of the town of Richmond. But in 1869, he and his brother would make headlines. According to James, he thought the Gallatin bank manager was a guy named Samuel P. Cox, a former Union officer who apparently killed his friend Bloody Bill Anderson during the Civil War. Anyway, James was apparently trying to take revenge and he entered the bank and ended the manager's life. Except it wasn't Cox, it was some other guy named John Sheets. Poor John Sheets. Not only that, the robbery netted James and his brother somewhere between $600 and $900. But James was charged with murder and then promptly skipped town, officially becoming an outlaw. A few years later, the James Younger gang was formed. The James brothers teamed up with Cole Younger and a few other former Confederate guerrillas they knew from the war. Now, in 1873, they staged the first robbery of a moving train in American history. The gang learned that a shipment of $75,000 worth of gold was being transported through Adair, Iowa to Chicago by the Rock Island Railroad. The gang set up a shop on a curve in the railroad tracks, and as the train rounded the bend, they used ropes to pull the tracks loose, derailing the train, plunging it into a ditch, injuring a whole lot of passengers, and killing the engineer and fireman, aka the guy that stoked the coals on the trains in those days. They went in one of the cars and forced a surviving guard to open the safe, but there was only around $3,000 in it. Not Butch Cassidy-type loot, but it was the equivalent of about $70,000 today. The James Younger gang's reputation was as one of the deadliest and most feared outlaws of the Wild West. The Jig is Up The downfall of Jesse James began with a bank robbery in 1876 that went horribly wrong. On September 7, 1876, Jesse and his gang tried to rob the First National Bank in Northfield, Minnesota. As they were doing it, the townspeople got a bit suspicious. Quite a few of the locals had their own weapons and a firefight broke out in the streets once they realized what was happening. During the battle, two of the crew members lost their lives and the rest were forced to scatter. Now once they split up, the gang tried their best to blend in with the local population, but that didn't go so well either. Burning down 14 mills in the area also didn't help things, which they apparently did as a kind of symbolic middle finger to the county, its politicians, and its economy, which they thought was complicit with their tough economic situations after the war. Frank and Jesse managed to evade authorities for another few months, but they were eventually tracked down in St. Joseph, Missouri with the help of the same Pinkerton detective agency that we mentioned earlier. In the ensuing battle, Frank James surrendered, but Jesse managed to escape. He lived in hiding for the next few years, but in 1882, he was betrayed by one of his few remaining members of the gang, Robert Ford, who used his six-shooter on him while he was hanging a picture in his home. Ford was hoping to collect the bounty on James' head, but instead he was charged with murder and sentenced to death. Tough break. But the same day he was sentenced, he was pardoned by the governor of Missouri, who apparently knew Ford had intended to execute James. It was pretty sensational stuff, basically a government-sanctioned extrajudicial execution. In the aftermath, Ford and his brother collected a relatively tiny amount of the reward, fled Missouri, and started a stage show where they reenacted the famous shooting. Cherokee Bill One of the most famous Native American outlaws of the Wild West was a guy named Cherokee Bill. Bill was the name of Crawford Goldsby, born to a mixed father who was a Buffalo soldier during the Civil War and a mixed mother who was Cherokee, white, and black. He came from a diverse background, and his crimes? Well, they were anything but vanilla. He went on one of the most legendary and shortest rampages in Wild West history between 1894 and 1896. Cherokee Bill's criminal career began in the spring of 1894 when he dueled a man named Jake Lewis for beating up his younger brother. He went on a run and eventually met up with a couple other mixed-blood Cherokee outlaws, Jim and Bill Cook, and headed over to the capital of Cherokee Nation, Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The U.S. government had just bought a piece of Cherokee land and agreed to pay out over $250 to any Cherokee who had a legal claim. The outlaw trio did, so they went to collect their money. But the authorities caught wind of their whereabouts, and the inevitable Wild West scuffle ensued. One of the police officers was killed, and the gang got away. Now, Cherokee Bill and company then went on a bit of a rampage that included ending the lives of quite a few people, law enforcement and civilians alike, and robbing upwards of 10 different locations, including post offices, banks, 
general stores, and of course, a couple of trains. Cherokee Bill's violent behavior and frequent run-ins with the law quickly made him one of the most wanted men in Indian Territory. A large posse was formed to capture him and his gang, and a $1,500 reward was put out for his capture. Now, that was a lot of money back then. And in August of 1894, Cherokee Bill was finally captured in Nowata, Oklahoma, and sentenced to your classic death by being sent to the scaffolds. While he was being held in custody in the Fort Smith jail, Bill was given a pistol by another inmate to supposedly help him escape, which he of course tried to do. He shot and killed the guard who was watching him and almost got away, but he was eventually corralled and put back behind bars. On March 17, 1896, Cherokee Bill met the scaffolds in Fort Smith, Arkansas. He was just 20 years old. His last words were reportedly, I came here to die, not to make a speech. He kind of low-key did both. The Dalton Gang Next up, we have a group of brothers, some of whom went from being lawmen to lawless men. The Dalton Gang was made up of four brothers, Bob, Grat, Emmett, and Bill Dalton, plus a bunch of other cronies whose robbing spree lasted from 1890 to 1892. They were four of a staggering 12 kids who grew up in Missouri and who went on a spree of bank and train robberies in Kansas and California. The Daltons had beef with the Southern Pacific Railroad. Bill Dalton specifically wasn't too pleased with the company and reportedly called it the SP Robber Barons because of land disputes between the railroad and local farmers. The Daltons had also been cattle farmers, and the company had apparently cheated him and his brothers out of money for cattle they had sold to the railroad. So they started to take their revenge, but it didn't go too well at first. On February 6, 1891, the brothers robbed a Southern Pacific train near Alila, California. Well, they tried to rob it. How about that? The gang was able to stop the train by flagging it down with a red lantern and then went about trying to find the safe they thought had all the money in it. The brothers were pretty good at something called following the pay car. Pay cars were the railroad cars that carried all the cash and other valuables for things like payroll and company expenses. By following the pay car, the Daltons could anticipate when and where they would strike, which allowed them to plan their heist with pretty good accuracy. A lot of times they would use insider information they got through bribes or other more forceful means to learn about the movements of the pay car and the kind of stuff it was holding. But this one didn't go too well. The guy guarding the safe called the express messenger refused to open it and yet another firefight was on. In the battle, the messenger and the engineer were killed. The gang got away, but they got away with nothing. Goose egg, nada, not a doggone thing. They hit a few more pay cars in the following months with more success, netting a couple of thousand dollars each time. But the gang's big payday would come in July of 1892 when they hit a train at Prior Creek Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. The train had a whole lot of money on it this time, and after yet another engagement that saw two guards and an innocent passenger lose their lives, the gang was able to run away with about $17,000 in cash. But it came at a cost. A $5,000 bounty was placed on each one of the brothers' heads, the race was on to catch them and cash in. Don't hit the banks. A few months later in October of 1892, the brothers planned their most ambitious heist yet. This time it wasn't a train, but a bank. And it wasn't just one bank, it was two. At the same time. In the same town. The plan was to rob the First National Bank and the Condon Bank in Coffeyville, Kansas. The gang arrived in Coffeyville around 9.30 in the morning and proceeded to split up. Bob and Emmett went to the First National Bank, while Grat and fellow gang members Bill Power and Dick Broadwell went across the street to the Condon Bank. The plan was to take the town by surprise, but like their first train heist, it didn't go down so well. They were spotted by some of the local townspeople who quickly raised the alarm. The townspeople got their weapons and started gathering around the banks. When the gang entered the First National Bank, they were the ones who were surprised. A group of locals were already inside, and they were armed to the teeth. Yet another Wild West scuffle began. Meanwhile, at the Condon Bank, a duel broke out while Bill Power was on lookout. It was between Power and the town sheriff, who had also been tipped off to the gang's presence. Power was killed, the sheriff was wounded. In the end, the gang failed to rob either bank, and all but one member of the gang were killed. Bob, Grant, Broadwell, and Powell were killed in the battle, which apparently only lasted 15 minutes. Only Emmett survived, although he was pretty badly wounded and was later sentenced to life in prison. He was pardoned just about 20 years later, though, and ended up living fairly happily ever after, despite the demise of the rest of his gang. Oh, and Bill survived, too. Bill Dalton was never really involved in the actual meat and potatoes of the heist. He was more a lookout and a spy, and the guy who found the info on where the good pay carts were. In Coffeyville, he was outside of town waiting with a few extra horses to help with the escape that never happened. 
He made it out unscathed and started a new gang with a guy named Bill Doolin. They carried out only one bank robbery before Bill was killed by a U.S. Marshal in a cornfield in Oklahoma trying to escape from his hideout. The Lady Bandit of Arizona There have been quite a few women who did their fair share of banditry over the years. By the way, that's the first time I ever used the word banditry. Ever. We briefly mentioned Etta Place, the partner of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, who fled with them to South America. There was also Belle Starr, who was a part of the James Younger gang with the notorious Jesse James. But let's focus on another lady, the Lady Bandit of Arizona. The Lady Bandit of Arizona's real name was Pearl Hart. Well, no, not really. Actually, her name was Pearl Taylor. These outlaws in their names. She was born in Ontario, Canada, but eventually made her way south, first to Chicago and then to Arizona. Along the way, she became infatuated with the sharpshooter Annie Oakley, and seeds were planted for what would come next. In 1899, she met a material miner. The miner's name was Joe Boot, B-O-O-T, and he wasn't such a good influence. Together, the two started out robbing men that Hart would lure into a room. The men, thinking they were getting lucky, were instead not cold by a lurking boot. The scam wasn't raking in as much money as the couple would have liked, so they set their sights on stagecoaches. Their first attempt was, unfortunately for them, their last. They held up the Globe to Florence stagecoach outside of Globe, Arizona, and came away with a little over $400 in cash. But in their getaway, they kind of forgot they were in a desert, and they got lost. They set up camp, made a fire, fell asleep, and woke up to the business end of a sheriff's six-shooter. Now, Pearl Hart became a bit of a celebrity after that. People would come to visit her in her jail cell, and she'd even sign autographs. And then she escaped. She had some help from another inmate named Ed Hogan. The two quickly were recaptured, though. At her trial, a trial where the jury was entirely men, she admitted her guilt, saying she only started robbing to get money for her mother. Hmm. The story actually worked, and she was only sentenced to five years in prison. Joe Boot wasn't as fortunate, though. He got 30 years. What else do you want to know about the Wild West? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more Nutty History.